everyone, this is going to be the proof of uh, intermediate value theorem. So here's a statement of intermediate value theorem. It's an important property of uh, all continuous function on the closed interval. Okay, not an open interval, not a closed interval. And it's sort of about this hand icon. Um, if the number is in between these two n value of the function, sometimes fa is greater than fb, that's why it's phrased this way, um, the number is in between these two, then there will be um, some function value that becomes exactly that given value. Another way to understand intuitive sense that if this quantity is a continuously changing as we change our parameter x or variable from a to b. So it start from a, f of a, that's the beginning value, and this position or value is continuously changing from f a to f b. So it start from there and there. So it will eventually go through this L, um, L value that is in between. So that's what this is. But um, that uses our continuous uh, everyday notion of a continuous sense in mathematics. That's a tricky notion to clearly define. And the whole point of calling this one the theorem is that in using the mathematical definition um, of continuity, to establish this, establish this fact requires a little bit of a mathematical thinking and, uh, and you will see that our proof relies on some um, fundamental theorem something called uh, least upper bound property of the real numbers so we're going to wave our hands on that part the real proof the rigorous proof of the least upper bound property of the real numbers really goes down to the almost a philosophical level of um, on the structure of the real numbers and stuff like that at least the it at least separates uh, clearly separates our everyday notion of a continuity uh, from this discussion so that's the uh, that's why I'm presenting this uh, proof so kind of separate our um, everyday notion of continuity but you will see there are some um, it's a major theorem come in very fundamental theorem come in to to finish this off. So here's the um, fundamental case we want to deal with is that this intermediate value is not some arbitrary, it's going to be at zero and fa and fb is in a very special setting. fa is a negative number and fb is a positive number. So if you have, um, if you take care of this case, in general cases you know, just a few lines, you can do the a simple arithmetic, and then we can take care of the rest of the part. So this is a fundamental case, and reduced to um, a lot simpler um, situation. In our course, the definition of a continuity is described in terms of um, sequences. So in the very, very abstract and general space, this continuity is called a sequential continuity. But in our space, real numbers or any vector space you learn in undergraduate curriculum, they're all uh, equivalent. So in that um, kind of space, uh, the sequential continuity is equivalent to the continuity in the epsilon delta sense. But I like this uh, sequential continuity because you see this action a lot in there. So. Uh, what we're going to use is this xn sequence. So we're going to construct a nice sequence and play with it. Motivation behind constructing the sequence is the following. What we are looking for is an intermediate value. I realize that as a function value, right? fc equals l. That's the conclusion of the intermediate value theorem. So it's like a zero, x intercept. So we're computing the zero of this function, which is continuous. So if actually the f is given, how would you go out and find it? Um, not by looking at the graph. The one way is that you know you can look at the real line and kind of plug in a bunch of um, points and figure out um, where the close value is. So when you look at this uh, construction of the sequence, just think about that process. This is really the process we're kind of um, narrowing down to uh, where the zero is. So here's the first bit. We're looking at A and B. This is the interval. 
and we're gonna divide it into through two pieces. So we have one point here and another point that was original endpoints, but we're gonna divide into in half like this. So we have three points now. That three points is called a partition. So P1 is a collection of three points, A, an intermediate midpoint actually, and B. What we're going to do is we're gonna evaluate that three points. Uh, we're gonna evaluate the functions, uh, the function at the three point. And we know at the end point is a negative, and the other end point is a positive. That's the part of the condition. What about the middle one? We're going to evaluate that. It's either going to be positive or negative. If it happened that that was actually zero, bingo, we got that one right there. This is the value at the zero. So let's assume this guy is not zero. Either it's a positive or negative. Then we look for, okay, where is this zero? It's not here. It's either over here or there. So this construction um, is the process of looking for where these uh, fc equal zero here is located this idea of the smallest to largest is, is very important in mathematics because um, without ever actually finding it just using this word you can describe in a precise sense okay so let's, let's see that what is our first element x1 is that this element and this element and that element there are three elements to look at so it's going to be smallest element such that y value is greater than or equal to zero so if it is here definitely not that we know at that point y value is negative we don't know positive and negative here but we know definitely there is a positive here so we know there's at least one element x1 here if this is still positive that's going to be the smaller than this guy definitely so we'll choose x1 to be that but not this one we know it's less than zero so that's our x1 well, next step is you keep these three points and look at the, each of these two intervals and divide into another um, two pieces. Now we have one, two, three, four, five points. And x1 is the, either this one or that one. And um, we know that that is the point that first time in these three points, such that that um, uh, y value, when you evaluate the function becomes positive so this is going to be our x2 x2 is the smallest value in this five points among these five points so that's called p2 the p2 consists of five division points x2 is going to be the smallest value and then here such that such that the uh, y value is positive let me explain the relationship between x1 and x2 first thing I'd like to say is this P1 is three points and P2 is a five points but that three points is already in this five points right where it just keep adding more points to this partition point so all the P1's uh, point three points are here inside part of actually P2 and I'd like to argue that X2 is actually less than X1 so X1 appeared here because it's a part of it and x2 is the smallest among these all things such that is a positive. So maybe x1 is the only thing. Maybe x1 is here or x1 is there. But x2 is, if there is any, even smaller than an x1 that appears here where corresponding y value is positive. So if there is any, x2 uh, is going to be actually strictly less than. If there are no more, it's still all down there to zero then we will keep that x2 equal to x1. So I try to explain this situation in this picture here. x1 is here already, and we have a positive. But um, if there is any over there, x2 maybe appear earlier. There's more points because we introduced more points here. Maybe there's more points that is actually greater. If nothing in that preceding points here to the left of x1 is positive, we still have x2 uh, equal to x1. So. Um, by construction, actually, turns out this is always what's going to happen. So um, if you construct it this way, I hope this construction is clear enough, and then you're going to divide it again into two pieces, and then you find another um, x3 that is earliest from the left, such that function value is greater than or equal to zero. If you keep constructing like this, xn 
um, it's going to be next number is to the left if there is any so we have this absolute inequality just keep decreasing but they're all in between a and b so here is that big theorem it's called the monotone sequence theorem usually this theorem is introduced in the calculus too when they actually study more about the sequences of numbers but it says if it is bounded it's not going to two negative infinity or positive infinity staying inside interval which is the case for us we are all in this interval a to b if it is increasing or decreasing it's not going back and forth this in this in our case is decreasing sequence whenever you have the sequence doesn't go to negative infinity it keeps decreasing that's our case and it's going to approach a number in the real line of course that number must be inside this interval and it happened that it's uh, concluding this one requires um, very structure of the real numbers that really goes down to philosophical level. So if this is intuitive enough, and then if you believe this part does not use any part of the continuity of the function, right? Continuity of the function itself. It's just about numbers. And then we succeeded here. We at least uh, separated the yeah, um, everyday notion of continuity from our discussions, although we're using this theorem here. So let's move on to the next part. So because of the theorem, what we have is Xn we defined using this idea of the choosing the smallest element in each of this list approaches some number because it's decreasing. And this plus indicates that we're approaching from the right because it's decreasing, if you think about it as this index approaches infinity and the c is the real number and it's greater than um, can be greater than or equal to zero sorry about that you can easily argue that it has to be greater than um, strictly greater than a but i don't think it's important so i will leave that as a greater than or equal to here and then proceed with that existence now we use the continuity of this function so we have um, sequence of x values that is approaching something an actual number c then the function value when you plug in those um, x values you have a sequence of new numbers and that should approach l continuity um, this should exist and that should equal the function value at c so it's l is actually fc so that part is written here, L is at Fc, and that because f of xn, you see this, we chose these values xn such that the y value is always greater than or equal to zero. So we always have this property. All the f of xn is a positive because that's how we chose xn. So if these numbers are approaching something because of the continuity, that better be greater than or equal to zero. So subtlety is if you only have a greater than zero here and this um, conversion point, this approaching point can be greater than or equal to. But here we already have greater than or equal to zero. And I hope this makes sense. So all the values are greater than or equal to zero and what is approaching must be greater than or equal to zero. So here we have L greater than or equal to zero. Our goal is L is uh, showing that L is actually zero. So rest apart using this um, argument. So I'm going to introduce the structure of the argument and see if you like it. All right, the argument goes like this. The structure of the remaining argument is structured like this. What we want to show is L value is exactly zero. And what we're going to do is just suppose L is greater than one, greater than zero. The way to look at the statement is the following. Suppose someone in the, in the future or a thousand years later figured out some weird example of function f such that all this thing we have constructed is all all true and then it turns out that l value they calculated turns out to be greater than zero suppose someone figured out weird function f such they went through all this construction we had and they computed this xn as, I, as we constructed and they computed where it's approaching and then it turns out that va approaching value is a positive. Suppose that happened. Then what we're going to do with, the, with that property, we're going to rigorously argue, sometimes use the theorem, and, and that's why we need to make our theorems absolutely perfect and absolutely correct, because we're going to be using in this argument, it relies perfectly on this rigorous mathematical arguments. 
So we are in this hypothetical situation and in that situation we use this mathematical argument to draw a certain conclusion. All right, so this better be absolutely true. And you will see, and uh, if somebody claims that they found this example, and then we're going to use mathematical argument to show that we end up at some sort of nonsense, some sort of contradiction. So suppose we have all this thing um, lined up. So we got to think about why we have a contradiction, why do we have nonsense. Either there is some gap problem in our mathematical history, or what we have supposed, what we have claimed that there can be an example um, is this part's wrong. So we go for this part's wrong, not this part, because all the mathematical theorems uh, we establish is absolutely true. I know some of you have a difficulty of accepting that type of statement because that's not how things are like in the science and other fields. In mathematics, it's very unique. When we say it's a theorem, and that's it. There is no counterexample. There is no upsetting over overturn of the statement. It will be true forever. So what was wrong is that our supposition that L can be greater than zero is necessarily wrong. So let's start like that. Suppose L is greater than zero. So here it's on some location in C, and if you plug into the function, it turns out it's a positive. That's the situation we're assuming. The idea is the following. Remember the partition points? We obtained it by dividing this A to B interval into half, and we have a two um, intervals and divide those into another half, and we have four intervals and, and divide into another half, and 16 intervals, and so on. So we have all those uh, endpoints of the interval scattered around, and you can see that it's getting very, very dense. And you will find those points getting coming closer and closer to the points around C. And if you play with those function values at those points, and we get something interesting. So again, we're going to look at all those very, very densely spreaded partition points between A and B that is sketched here. So if there was nth division, then you will see starting from A. So we have divided into um, n times, the length will be 1 over 2 to the n. Every time you divide it, you have it. So the first point is very close to like A plus 1 over 2 to the n. Imagine that n is like 100. So this is a very, very small amount. Next number will be A plus 2 divided by 2. And so this index increases here. And that's what how this general point looked like right here. So suppose we have this partition I want you to think about. Um, we having lots of points, they're all on space with the same um, distance to each other. And it'll eventually hop over the C or it's gonna coincide with the C. We don't know what the C is, but if you spread this point on between A and B, there will be this kth point here and k plus force point is going to go across that point. There is this unique choice of this point, the index k, that is written here. C is in between this kth point and the k plus fourth point, and you got to put this equal symbol somewhere, so there's a unique choice of k. So that's the mathematical description of what I meant by if you spread this lots and lots point in here, we can find some points that is very, very close to C. So that's how you and describe mathematically. And I label those point, label those point as Zn. So given nth division, so the division with length 1 over 2 to the n, there is this unique point. That point is called a Zn. Then that point Zn must approach C from the left. So Zn is always on to the left of C, and this distance between the next point is getting smaller and smaller because they're always 1 over 2 to the n. So it must be very, very arbitrarily close. So that part's clear. So Zn approach C from the left. And here we use continuity again. If Zn, this is uh, values on x-axis, is approaching something, then f of Zn must approach that number L. What is L? That's the function value, fc um, equals L.
So that's the continuity. Again, there's another sequence of number approaching C that the function value at there must approach L, the function value at C. So let me explain using this picture what I'm about to write down, and that's going to be a mathematical statement, so it's better explain what those are first. So L is here. We assume that's a positive quantity, so it's away from the zero. It's a y-coordinate. And we argued using the continuity that f of zn is approaching L. So this f of zn value is all gathered around this L value. So how are we going to precisely describe this statement, gather around L value? It's approaching there. So the following is a one technique. You choose any value in between an L1, L, and 0, like half of L, or anything in between, a third of L and two-thirds of L, it doesn't matter. At some point, I think in my video, as I mentioned sometimes, if Zn is approaching, for example, 0, you can always say that. Say that zn is in between negative 1 and 1, or negative 10th and a positive 10th, no matter what um, the symmetric bound you choose, zn, because they approach 0, eventually will come inside that whatever interval you choose will never escape outside. So that's pretty much the meaning of a you know, sequence approaching L. So if that approaches L, it's going to be all gathered around. How are we going to say it nicely? If you put this bound here, uh, half L, or out there, third um, half L, three halves L, then it's going to be all gathered around here because FCN um, approaches L. So that's what's stated here. Because what I'm going to use is the one of the particular integral um, inequality here, I only stated there, but let me state the other parts. So that's what I wanted to add. This is a half L, it's located here. That was a full copy of L, and another half L more will be over here. So if you put this inequality, because FCN approaches L, they're all going to come inside here and never escape this part. But what we, we're only going to use just this part of the inequality, especially the fact that FCN is greater than 0. This half times L is greater than 0 because we assume L is away from that 0. So I stated here, Zn is one of the partition points. Remember, the way we cho chose Zn is one of the partition number that is very, very close to C value from the left. So that's the partition points. And we have the property that f of Zn is a positive. One of the partition points became positive function value. So I want you to pause the video and really think about, I'd like to claim here, this is where the contradiction nonsense kicks in. So if you can pull this nonsense out of this discovery here, yourself. So here it is. Let Zm, so those are the number we define what those Zn are, so that's um, very, very close. And Zm is always, the Zm is one of them, let me say that. It, we have lots of Zn, like this, it's going to eventually come inside here. We have a lot and a lot and a lot of them. And Zm is going to be just one of those numbers. Choose anything that it's satisfied this one. We know it's going to happen many, many times. So Zm is one of them. We know by choice it's less than or equal to zero. And Zm was one of those partition points. So it looks like that, k divided by 2 to the something. I think I was wrong in the index part. It, I think it has to be m there. Think about the choice of um, Zm is the left closest point in that partition um, to C. So um, its level, the denominator is always the same as the index. Right? That's our choice. It's the k that um, something determined. So I think it's m. So Zm looks like this. And at that uh, function value, its power of choice is going to be some positive number. So here's kind of summary, and here's um, you have to change that to n again, m. All right, I fixed it there. So that's our zm slightly to the left of c can be c. And here's the key: those um, xm again. Um, let me write this n equals m. All right, so all the n is actually same as m. So that's what I wrote here. The key thing is that and this is the value where f function value is uh, greater than 0. 
And here is another f um, point we found that it's greater than function value is greater than zero. So this xn wasn't just any value in here in the partition points in this level m where this greater than zero. This was the smallest x value such that the function value is greater than zero in this level m partition. But what we are seeing here is that um, this one so I, this you have to be really, really careful in when you make this kind of fictitious situation argument about this fictitious situation. So I spotted another minor mistake. So I'm going back to our choice of ZM and think about the goal is that this is supposed to be the smallest element in that partition as a positive. But we kind of spotted that there's another one is even smaller than as a positive, that that contradicts our choice of XN. But if you look at the inequality that I put it in there, and our choice of ZM was a little bit problem. So I'm going back and and remind ourselves um, ourself of the choice of ZM. Here's where the ZNs are selected. ZN is this left number in this interval, such that at C is in between. So this leaves the possibility that ZN can be equal to C. But where you put this inequality, an equal symbol, it doesn't matter. Zn is going to approach C anyway. So if you put this equal symbol to the right, not to the left, it eliminates the possibility that Zn will be ever actually equal to C. So that helps us to uh, get a very uh, definite conclusion and in that comparison with the Xm and Zm. So I fixed it here, and our choice of Zn is going to be this number k divided by 2 to the n which is actually strictly less than c but um, and where c is in between this number and c can be um, this number on the right so zn will never be actually equal to c so if you come back here that we have the zm for which the function value is positive and xm and function value is also positive and xn can be great and must be greater than or equal to c and zm is actually less than c so there's no chance that zm can be equal to xn and xn from our choice or xm from our choice must be the smallest number appearing in that partition here level m for which function value is positive but you can see um, you can see that there is another number there's a function value it's a positive there so xm wasn't the smallest one that contradicts our choice of xm so that was the contradiction and I concluded here xm is not the smallest x value with y value greater than zero in that uh, level m partition so that actually concludes that um, case special case we looked at because um, l greater than zero gave a contradiction so there l must be zero and that fc is um, zero so we're here to show the general case. f of x is just any continuous function on a, b, and l is intermediate uh, value. The trick is that uh, to consider following function f of x minus l, l is intermediate value, and this uh, remain continuous by choosing a plus and minus, we can put this function, new function, gx, into the setting where ga is less than zero gb is greater than zero and an x um, intermediate value l here is a zero so here's the explanation about this choice a little bit suppose if this is general case and fa is less than fb and l is an intermediate choice and in that case we're going to choose the gx to be positive xl minus l and i'm going to show later below that this satisfy our earlier setting if the function is actually opposite case fb is actually smaller than fa and l is in between you can sketch the situation it's kind of decreasing kind of situation then you can choose gx to be the same fx minus l negated then this function in that case satisfy the earlier setting so this case here is for the first one so i look at this um, i'm showing why this one satisfy the earlier setting if this is the first case right here and I'm going to subtract L both sides, so fa minus L, 
is L minus L is 0, Fb minus L is here. So this function, if you look at this, this part here, that looks exactly like f of x minus l with x equals a in it, and this one f of x minus l with x equals b in it. So this is ga, and that's gb, which is written here, ga and gb. So this function has this earlier setup. ga is less than gb, and 0 is the intermediate value. So let's look at this case here. So in that case, if you subtract L both sides, you have uh, Fb minus L and Fa minus L. But since it says negative, so we have, we're going to multiply negative. So Fa minus L, which appeared here with negative symbol, and Fb minus L appeared on the, over there with negative symbol. Because you multiply negative, it switches the direction of inequality. So that's what this is. So this one looks like this function with x equals a in it that one looks like this function with x equals b in it. So we can rewrite this one if we define g of x like this, g of a and g of b is having the 0 as intermediate value. So by choosing plus or minus appropriately for depending on the situation of this situation, we can turn that g of x into um, the same setting. So from with this g of x we have the conclusion because we proved this case g of a, g of b, intermediate value like this. So both cases g, of, um, g is continuous, so if you um, apply that result, we have g of c equal to 0, so g of c equal to 0, it's a corresponding this case. So let me write that down. So by early result, g is continuous and satisfying all this condition, we have conclusion that there is a value in between a and b, and g of c equals 0. What g of c is, is fc minus l and plus minus, but that um, makes it either plus or minus, fc is going to reach l. So that's how you take care of the general case using the earlier case. So this, in, this is uh, the proof of intermediate value theorem using our sequential continuity definition. And in it, we use this um, property, that monotone sequence theorem, and which uses a very um, the structure of the real number, which is, um, which is a big deal in mathematics.